Hello, I am Dr. Ahmed Abdullah, and <clears throat> this is um, completing the part one articulation and resonance lecture. Uh, unfortunately, due to time limits on the uh, recording system, um, the system stopped within a period of time because of limited memory. So I'm now completing this part, uh, articulation and resonance, uh, part one, and we are going to skip <coughs> uh, to the area that we stopped at previously. So, previously we spoke about the two muscles that make up the fascial pillars or what we call them sometimes the uh, palatal arches. If you open your mouth, you're gonna see them. <coughs> I had an image here. Um, yeah, here. So these are the fascial pillars. So the anterior, what you see when you look in the mirror, this is the wall that is made by the palatoglossus muscle. And the wall behind it on the other side See, here you have the tonsils, called the palatine tonsils, and behind them you see this structure, that's the other wall coming down, that's the palatopharyngus, because it connects with the pharynx behind and below. And in between, so they go down, the two muscles curve like this, one is the anterior palatoglossus, and one is the palatopharyngus. And as they come down, they leave a triangle in between them. And in that triangle, the, that will be the location of the palatine tonsils. So the palatoglossus makes the anterior wall of the fascial pillars, uh, left and right, and the palatopharyngus um, makes the posterior wall of the fascial pillars. And you could see here, the palatoglossus and behind it the palatopharyngus, but the palatopharyngus keeps going down and it gets embedded into the uh, pharyngeal constrictors and it goes also down to be embedded into the, um, the posterior. Uh, it, it will be also connected onto the, um, the, uh, the, the uh, what do you call it? Uh, the, the, the velum itself, where the t some tissue will go up and it will cross over through uh, the, in the velum and cross over and it will interdigitate uh, on top. <clears throat> and below, um, you can see the other fibers get embedded into the pharyngeal constrictors. So we begin now speaking about, uh, speaking about resonance. Resonance disorders, okay? Resonance disorders do not have a relationship. They do not result from vocal fold pathology. <clears throat> vocal fold pathology, they give voice disorders. Aphonia or dysphonia. Aphonia could be loss of voice for any reason. Dysphonia is bad voice. So in either case, both are voice disorders and they result from abnormalities involving the vocal folds. Now, when we speak about resonance disorders, these disorders do not result from the vocal folds. They result from abnormalities along the vocal tract, okay? So there are three different resonance disorders that occur here. But first, before we discuss that, I will discuss the, um, the, um, the structure, the anatomic structure, and especially with reference to wall dye, wall dyer's ring. Imagine a cluster of grapes, and it has five, gra five pieces uh, of grapes, and all of them are in one cluster. All this cluster is fed by little branches that branch from a big stem to individual pieces of grapes. So that wall dyer's ring is a system of tonsils that, that is found in the posterior nasal cavity. 
and in the uh, oropharynx. Um, and the purpose, the wall there is ring this system of tonsils um, <clears throat> is part of the immune system um, the lymph called the lymphoid systems. Your body has the blood vessel system and another system parallel with it is the lymphoid system. The, you know, tubes and pipes that will bring uh, into all parts of your body, but that immune system fluid is clear. It is filled with white blood cells and antibodies and all of this. So part of this is to provide protection for the um, nasal, for the, for the upper airway. So the upper airway, nose and, and mouth, so here you have the adenoid that is part of wall dyer's ring. The adenoid, who sometimes we call it the adenoid pad or the adenoids, whatever you call it. It is like two pieces of peanuts that you put next to each other. So you can consider it as one piece or two pieces. And normally it's the sizes, the normal size is, is like this. And, and beneath it, this, the, the root of it is called the pharyngeal um, uh, tonsil and um, it is usually like a little pad like this for the velum to to contact and to make a seal against so that you can make all your oral sounds i explained that before so in here the this part of the upper pharynx of the nasopharynx this and i mean the the posterior pharyngeal wall the upper segment i mentioned before and the superior pharyngeal constrictors they they are able that muscle i mean superior pharyngeal constrictor muscle is is going to help with swallowing and with also closing the velopharyngeal port remember the velopharyngeal port is all this space between the velum and the, and, and the posterior pharyngeal wall here. All this space is called the velopharyngeal port, like a, an airway. So, this little seg, uh, naso, uh, I mean pharyngeal wall, uh, that's part of the nas nasopharynx. When you swallow or when you close, you lift up the velum, it bulges out comes forward with the adenoid pad bulges forward and so that it can meet the alum and then this way you can establish a seal <clears throat> and you you uh, separate the oral cavity from the nasal cavity i explained this in the um, in the original video when i discussed um how the velum modifies the vocal tract so now you see here the opening of the eustachian tube. Each ear has a eustachian tube and that, is, can, that drains onto the nasopharynx. So on the right side you have one and on the left side you have one. So if there's fluid in the middle ear for a reason, you know, and conditions are good, that fluid will drip into and the purpose nasal drip. Now when the, the uh, in normal conditions, the adenoids are, have a small size. They secrete fluids and um, immune system fluids around in this area here. And that as the air is coming in, it purifies the air. We have little hairs here to, to separate, you know, to block some of the big dust particles and allergens and then we have a muc mucus along all these walls that will attract uh, dust particles and then in the back here we are going to have immune system fluid uh, flies uh, bacteria and viruses of course these activities are most active in the younger ages for children like up to age eight or nine years so the that part of the wall dyer's ring, the adenoid pad. <clears throat> I'm going to speak about what happens in, in terms of resonance after. Um, the other uh, tonsil system that is part of wall dyer's ring is a kind of, see this is your station tube, around it there's a tonsil here around it 
gold the tubal tonsil from tube eustachian tube tubal tonsil so that is protects the entrance and protects the the opening of the eustachian tube against bacteria and germs then we have the palatine tonsils that you show you saw so that will be uh, secreting fluid into the oral cavity and when you eat it neutralizes uh, you know, um, mixes with the saliva, uh, the fluid mixes with the saliva and it neutralizes germs. In the bottom of the tongue, in the base of the tongue here, we have the lingual tonsil. The lingual tonsil also protects uh, with both um, food and liquid against germs and bacteria, and also it might contribute to, uh, you know, neutralizing some of the pathogen, uh, pathogen genes <laughs> coming by here. So these are the systems. Again, the adenoid pad or the adenoids, the tubal tonsil, the palatal tonsil, four of them. However, two, two like the, the palatine tonsils are two pieces. So you have five, five pieces of grapes in one cluster and they are fed by the same fluid that goes from you know that feeds all three of them and this explains why when someone has a problem with the adenoids they usually have also a problem with the palate and tonsils so that 66 percent of people who have adenoid problems or tonsil problems will have uh, both of them 66 <clears throat> percent two-thirds so now, what happens when there are disorders? What happens when the adenoid pad becomes abnormally enlarged? Remember, the lips are supposed to close the, the, the oral cavity, to keep the oral cavity closed like a purse all the time. The normal state, if you are not talking, you should be sitting, your mouth is closed. The airway, the nasal cavity is for breathing. Remember, remember how this, how big it is here. Normally, it's, it's little, but then it can expand to be, in some extreme cases, almost as big as a golf ball. So imagine the blockage, the person. So any growth that is adenoidal hypertrophy, abnormal enlargement of the adenoids. Enlargement of the uh, lingual tonsils, the palatine tonsils, is called, um, it is called tonsillar hypertrophy, tonsillar. Enlargement of both the adenoids and the tonsils together is called adenotonsillar hypertrophy. So now, <clears throat> once the, the uh, um, I mean, if the adenoids become enlarged, um, abnormally they are going to block the air the, the velopharyngeal port either partially i mean partially mostly but but the, the degree of blockage how severe the condition is so so now in these conditions more than one thing is going to happen the adenoids are going to the, the um, abnormally big adenoids are going to bl block the normal circulation of air through the the eustachian tube so the eustachian tube will be will not have access to ventilation the eustachian tube has to access has to be opening and closing when you swallow when you eat and and so on so the air will have normal pressure if you have if you do not have normal pressure, you have negative pressure that will cause middle ear infections. So the adenoids could cause blockage or abnorm abnormal functioning of the eustachian tubes, one or the other, and that is going to lead to middle ear infections and a lot of problems. These middle ear infections uh, are going to cause what is known as conductive hearing loss. Conductive means the pathway, the outer ear or middle ear has uh, some kind of a problem that doesn't <clears throat> make it uh, transmit the sound normally. 
Yes, that can be treated, that can be cured completely. However, when children are developing, when you have and you have frequent middle ear infections and episodes of frequent uh, conductive hearing loss because of the fluid and so on, <clears throat> that will cause disruption in the development of speech, language, cognition, attention, mem problems are going to go wrong. So children normally by age eight years um, are, should have that the bad note should have developed to the the best you know normal limit and also the station tube most of the facial plate and facial structures will have grown develop, developed uh, significantly and middle ear infections should not but the problem is when you have a child coming to you at nine years of age and yes the child uh, doesn't have middle ear infections when he or she comes to you as a speech pathologist and you say oh there's a a severe speech articulation disorder oh there is a, a severe there are severe attention problems and severe language problems and so on. You have to look at the history and if there is a history of, you know, frequent middle ear infections, that could be the biggest, probably in some cases, and the most significant contributor to the problem that you have. What I am saying is the middle ear infections caused by the um, caused by abnormalities in the station tube that can be a result of adenoid enlargement these problems could go away however the effect of these problems is gonna can last for years it can last for months depending on when you catch it when you provide intervention for it so it will have a direct Enlarged adenoids are going to have a direct impact on children's academic performance, memory, attention, and uh, socialization and behavior, and uh, is going to cause sleep apnea. Uh, the person will be sleeping, especially when he or she sleeps on their back. The velum will sit down on that big pad, and then you have the airway blocked because the fluid will stick, will make the velum stick, and then the person will have a sleep apnea. They will be choking when they're uh, sleeping, and then they just have quality of sleep will be very bad. They might lose up to 30% of their sleep time. So the child then, you know, is in bed for 10 hours. However, in reality, he or she slept only four or six hours. So they go to the school next day, and they're sleepy and lethargic in a bad mood. They don't want to, you know, they are impatient, they are uh, inattentive and all of this. And you could simply, by looking at one thing, two things actually, you'll be able to, to put your finger on the problem. When you look at the breathing, we said the nasal cavity is for breathing. The oral cavity is for eating, and if, it, if nothing is there or speaking, <laughs> you close your lips. So, a big sign of adenoidal enlargement is open lips and open mouth. The person will be like this. And you can hear them breathing. That is a big sign in children, in children. That's a big sign of adenoidal hypertrophy. And then the next thing that you ask is, you ask the parent, does your child snore at night? And you are going to, most often, you are going to get the answer, oh yes, oh my God. So, snoring is a big part because there's sleep apnea as well. The other thing that you will notice is there will be weakness in the oral muscles because the person is keeping his or her mouth not active, just open all the time and that's gonna cause weakness of the muscles you have to activate them again so that they can do their job of closing the lips and normally uh, when the person is not speaking um okay so we'll move on to the voice 
When you have this situation now, talking this, we have three sounds that will be affected by this. When you say the nasal sounds, mm, 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 that will cause something called na denasal voice or uh, also called hyponasal voice. Means there isn't enough air going out when you make mm, mm, mm. Only the three sounds, the three nasal sounds. However, there is another problem not related to the adenoids but related to other problems uh, when there is not enough closure here there's not enough seal where when you make your oral sounds air leaks out the, the, there's not enough closure here air leaks out into the nasal cavity like when you say i say oh or hi how are you doing today so when you do this, the velum is down and the velopharyngeal pore is is a little bit open. It's not making a seal, so that will make air escape here while it is also escaping through my mouth, and that makes my voice nasal. Hyper nasality, simply by having a, a clear straw that you put into the air, and you have the person say a vowel because all you know vowels. Uh, so. <clears throat> If you see mist, that means there's hypernasality. You can also get a dental mirror. We say <clears throat> they sell them at ASHA and conferences, like a whole bunch of them for just you know ten dollars or something. And they can they are disposable as well. You put it under the nose and say so ask the person to make a vowel, extend it. Say e uh, and then as they say that, you can see the mist accumulating on the mirror, and then you know there is hypernasality. So this is how you test it. So in some cases when there is a surgery, and if too much of the tissue is taken out of the adenoids because of, you know, surgery, um, that, that can prevent full closure of the velopharyngeal port. The velum can try its best, but there's a gap in there and the air leaks out of it. This is why physicians take the excess tissue. They do not just take the whole thing out and they let some growth go back <coughs> because the adenoids should shrink by puberty. And if by puberty they start to shrink and the, the, the person had the surgery a long time ago and there's not enough growth there, that is going to cause that situation where air will leak out. Another situation is when the velum is short, it cannot reach the back. So there are many causes why hypernasality occurs, but um, um, you need to know what it sounds like and from either congenitally short velum or, um, or a maybe a surgical procedure that resulted in taking too much tissue out of the adenoids or <coughs> A sluggish velum. If someone has a neurological disorder or by habit, the velum is just hypoactive. And so it depends. So these are these two situations, hypernasality and um, hyponasality. And then we have cul de sac. I put a link to a video. <coughs> to a video of a young woman demonstrating um, uh, cul-de-sac resonance and we have cul-de-sac resonance when both the adenoids are very enlarged and uh, I mean the adenoids and the palatine tonsils both of them are enlarged so the air doesn't there's not enough room for for the air to circulate up there's not enough room to for the muscles, so the person is like speaking with the voice trapped inside. So these disorders again are resonance disorders. Yes, we evaluate them as as, as part of voice evaluations, but they are not related to the vocal folds. They are resulting and they are related to the vocal tract. Okay, so now we are going to speak about the tongue muscles. Tongue muscles, there are two groups of them. One group is called the extrinsic lingual muscles, and one is the intrinsic. And conveniently, there are four of each. So the um, extrinsic muscles, 
I mean, the difference between the two is that the extrinsic muscles, extrinsic, they have a, an, usually an origin outside of the tongue. And then they have an insertion onto the tongue itself. So this way you can make big movements of the tongue. Like the muscle to, that you used to say, oh, the styloglossus muscle is like here. Let's go, one is here on the other side, there's another one, a branch of it. So it's gonna lift, you know, pull the back of the tongue and lift it up to hump the tongue back. And this is what, how we make the high uh, back vowel of oo or o. Um, then, um, these muscles, again, they have an origin somewhere out of the tongue and an insertion onto the tongue. And they do the heavy lifting for the tongue. And they contribute directly to making sounds. Um, and also the other ones as well. The intrinsic muscles, both insertion and origin are on the tongue itself, the part of the tongue that you see. So we are, and they shape the contour, like have a piece of gum inside of your mouth and chew it. And you want to flip it, to move the, the, the gum from here to here. How do you do that? Just think about it. Um, so the tongue makes these movements, twisting and, and re, very fine tuned movements that are needed for swallowing and that are needed for feeding and um, also for speech as well. So it does more of the fine grade movements and control of the tongue. So now uh, let's look at the uh, extrinsic muscles and we are gonna associate each one with the sounds that it actually makes. So you need to know which muscle does what, where it originates, where it inserts and what sounds it can help us make. The genial glasses. Genio means chin, chin. That here, chin, the chin bone. The genial glasses originates on the interior surface of the chin bone. And it fans out like a seashell. It fans posteriorly and superiorly. And you can see it curves a little bit. So this, all these fibers are the uh, genial glasses. And that makes the bulk, the biggest part of the tongue. So what it does is it pulls the tongue into a trough and it protrudes the tongue tip between the teeth and it helps you press the tip of the tongue against the alveolar ridge. So you need to think doing these movements, how, what sounds can it help me do? So, okay, it makes the tongue into a trough. What sound do you make the tongue, you know, involves making the tongue into a trough like this? The R sound, R, that is R, that's the sound that is, um, that is made by this muscle, R. And the E, 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 when you say E, that's going to lift up the tongue uh, close to the alveolar ridge um, to make the E. So I included some here, but I expect you to take note of what I mentioned he here, because otherwise if everything is in, on the slides, why do I need to record? Okay, what sounds can the junior glosses help us make in addition to the E the, and the R? Uh, how about uh, all I mean, the sounds that enable protrusion of the tongue tip uh, out of the mouth, or which are th, th, and th, 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 are made by the genial glasses. How about sounds that we need to, we need to make by pressing the tongue tip against the alveolar ridge? We discussed that yesterday in the previous, in the second video. And um, you can simply go to the group of alveolar sounds and um, that are made between the tip of the tongue and the alveolar ridge. There are six of them. I'm going to say them again here. S, z, t, d, and o, and n, 
okay six sounds that you make and that the junior glosses helps you make all these sounds the hyoid glosses hyoid glosses here is the muscle here's the hyoid bone this muscle originates on the hyoid bone and it it rises sup, uh, superiorly and anteriorly at an angle like this so whenever a muscle has an like an oblique um, kind of um, orientation it will do two movements at once <clears throat> i mean it will it will move something in two ways so this way this uh, hyoglossus our hyoglossus muscle is going to pull the posterior part of the tongue it will pull it down and back okay down and back so you say ah the tongue sits down to the lowest level and it goes back far back and this is how we make the ah sound and this is why as we explained that will cause smaller um, hypopharynx and that will raise the frequency for f1 for any sound that is going to cause that constriction except for the o and they explained the reasons why as well in the previous videos so that is another one so we know now this hyoglossus muscle enables us to say the ah uh, sound okay and also the a uh, a uh, sound the palatoglossus palatoglossus as you could see uh, has um, uh, an uh, origin and uh, onto the palatal paneurosis and the soft palate and it goes down to insert onto the um, to connect onto the posterior um, inferior margins of the tongue so it is like like this the fossil pillar so it can either lift up the tongue or it can bring down the velum can you think of a sound or sounds that this muscle can help us make we are going to have here um, the palatal glosses is going to help us make sounds like mm, mm, a velar sound mm, uh, sounds like uh, g. so um, then the stylo glosses the stylo stylo process and the tongue um, we said it inserts onto the posterior uh, lateral margins of the tongue. One side here, the other side, uh, the other side inserts on the other side of the tongue. And what it does is it pulls the tongue back. See, because it's oblique, it pulls it down back and up to make the sound oo and o. Oh. And uh, the, I'm just giving you just particular sounds that are very, that you cannot make without this. this. Uh, so now you know each muscle, you know where it originates, where it inserts, and most importantly, what it does and what sound uh, or what group of sounds it will help us make. Then we move on to the intrinsic muscles. Intrinsic muscles here, see, the intrinsic muscle fibers here sit on top of the genioglossus. All of these muscles here are the intrinsic muscles so let's let's explain the intrinsic muscles you have the tongue imagine it is like, like this you have a superior longitudinal muscles that go from the back to the front and the fibers go like this superior longitudinal muscle and then the inferior longitudinal muscle will be going under the tongue when you stick your tongue up under that you're gonna find the, the inferior longitudinal muscle so the superior is here the inferior is here and at the tongue tip they join at the tongue tip like this they make like a sandwich like this okay so you can now you can imagine uh, there is a muscle in between these two sandwiches in between, but the fibers are going like coils of a mattress, going vertical. That's called the vertical muscle, vertical tongue muscle. 
or lingual muscle. And then there is a muscle that goes from left to right. It's called the transverse muscle of the tongue, side to side. So now look at the longitude. And you have to think about it so you'll be able to imagine the function. It is like this. And they are because the uh, longitudinal muscles are attached at the tongue tip, you can see the boundary here between them. If you contract the superiors, that's going to lift up, will lift up this, uh, the, the tongue tip. If you contract the inferior, that will bring the tongue tip down. Okay, so like this, like that. Now, the muscle in between, that is the vertical. If you contract it, contraction means shortening. That's going to shorten the thickness of the tongue. So what, when you shorten the thickness of the tongue, what happens to it? You have a flat tongue. Okay, you flatten the tongue. Now, what about the transverse? The trans from side to side. So, again, a muscle shrinks when it contracts. So, when it shrinks, it will narrow the tongue with, it will narrow it. But when you narrow it, where does the tissue go? When you narrow, it will make the tongue thicker and longer. So, these are the functions that are just that, that you see here. And again, you can explain them by simply thinking about the behavior of the muscles and how they are located. Now we move on to the labial muscles. First one is the orbacularis, orbacularis horus. That's the circular muscle that is supposed to keep the tongue closed like a purse. And the orbicularis is covered by this, you know, kind of worm-like border that's called the vermilion border. The verm verma means worm. Vermilion border is the border that looks like a worm. But the, the muscle is, is deeper underneath. The, uh, this muscle, the orbicularis horus, is required for making any bilabial sounds. Look in the chart of consonants and tell me what bilabial sounds there are. For example, p, b, m, um, p, b, m. I think these are all. And um, and also w, w, and u. The w and u are, are uh, this is the glide and u is a vowel. <coughs> So five different phonemes are made by the li two lips together. We call that bi means two labial. And then uh, the risorius muscle is a muscle that uh, inserts onto the uh, I mean inserts onto the corners of the lips, and and it just goes up a little bit. It has a like a, a higher kind of you know kind of. Uh, origin here. So when it contracts, it gives you that smile, that smile lifting up the corners of the mouth and retracting them. This is why people say to you, say cheese. What you do is you get the resorious muscles and pull the corners and lift them up. And this is how you make the fake smile. I mean the, the real smile. <laughs> Picture smile. Picture perfect. Um, so this uh, muscle is, is needed for smiling, uh, facial expression, and also for making the sound E or E, retracting the lips. And that is here, let me show you, it is here. So you notice it has a slight kind of, a, you know, oblique, it's, it's, you know, the origin is a little bit higher than the insertion, and when it contracts, it lifts up the corners of the mouth up a little bit and draws them back for smiling. Then we have the um, buccinator. Okay, buccinator. Some people say buccinator. I don't know <laughs> why, but the, it is the buccinator. So, uh, bacchus means the pocket of the cheek. And uh, buccal cavity also is the pocket of the cheek between the cheek and the teeth. 
uh, it is important when you swallow, when you eat, to, to prevent food from falling into that pocket because it can wreak havoc on your teeth, you know, with the f um, uh, particles of food sitting inside of your cheek, giving bad odor. And in addition to that, bacteria and uh, rotting your teeth and all kinds of problems. So for this reason, this muscle that is inside of the cheek, inside of the cheek pads, that's the buccinator, enables you to firm your cheeks while you are chewing and swallowing. It's to basically firm your cheeks to prevent food from falling between the teeth because you are grinding food on the teeth, Gr you know, crushing and grinding. And things are going to fall this way or that way. But this buccinator is going to firm up and it will prevent any food uh, from falling between, between the teeth and the buccal cavities, uh, or inside of the buccal cavities. And this muscle is, is here, a buccinator. Um, <clears throat> So um, the zygomaticus, zygomaticus major and zygomaticus minor, uh, major means longer and minor is smaller. So this is the zygomatic bone, zygomatic bone, one of the most prominent bones of our body. And here, so the zygomatic major um, goes from the zygomatic bone and inserts onto the corner of the um, into the corner of the um, lips and the zygomatic minor uh, inserts onto the slightly into the the uh, upper corner of the uh, lip uh, each side uh, the function is to um, it, it enables us in uh, compressing the cheeks when i'm sorry i'm sorry it enables us to perform facial expressions um, it enables us to draw up the corners of the lips and also uh, back, uh, contributing to the smile with the rhizorius muscle, see? Um, there is a video that you can go to to learn more about this. So these muscles are very critical for expression and also for eating, for feeding. Um, and social communication. Uh, our face as animals is the only area where we have muscles just inserting into skin. So when we, we make any twitches, it will change the configuration of our face and you can read a person's emotions easily just based on the contractions of their faces. Their faces and their tiny contractions are going to enable us to see a reflection of their emotions inside around the eyes around the mouth and so on and babies little babies are very they they are very attuned to these tiny changes and they can read your mood so then we have the levator labii superioris from the name you know latin as levator means lifting uh, lift, lifter and labii means lips and superioris is the, the higher, the ones to lift up the upper lip. So the um, levator, um, let me wear my glasses here for a second. The levator um, labii superioris, it or originates onto the, on the maxilla, maxillary bone, and it goes down on, on one side of the tongue. It goes down to insert onto the um, upper lip <clears throat> in the center of the upper lip on each side so when it uh, it contracts it's going to raise up the upper lip like you know if, if you kind of if you show like disgust or or something like that the then the libeto libii superioris alac nasi that here is going to enable us to flare the nares, nere, expand the openings, uh, the, 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 the nares, openings of the nose. Um, 
and it enables you know it enables you to make like an, a sneering expression with your nose. The depressor angularis angle means uh, anguli means angle. Depressor is the one that pulls down, and um, orus means circular. So the depressor angularis is at the angle here, and there's another one it should be here. So it it inserts onto the corners of the lips, uh, the the lips, and uh, originates on the mandible. So when it contracts, it will pull the corners of the lips down to reverse the function of the the resorius and the uh, zygomatic major. In other words, it gives you a sad expression, or it enables you to um, compress the upper lip against the um, the lower lip. The depressor labii in inferioris, uh, this one is depressor labii inferioris. Right here on one side, it should be another one on this side. So when it is it, it, it pulls down the lower lip. So why do you need to do that? Depressing the so the um, function is to pull the corners of the lips downward for the expression of sadness or for irony. The mentalis, uh, this muscle, this area is called the mental mental process. So the mentalis is this muscle that originates on the mental process and it inserts onto the surface of the, um, uh, the the soft tissue of the chin. So it, it enables us to raise the chin and to protrude the lower lip. Mm -hmm. Like this, expression of doubt. Um, now let's look quickly at the nasal landmarks. The basic... Um, landmarks of the outer nasal cavity, I mean the outer nasal, you know, kind of structures. First, this area is called the high point, the high point of the nose. And the um, opening is called the nair, nair, and nair is two of them. They are separated by a septum here. That area is called septum. The septum is connected onto a wall that divides both chambers of the nasal cavity. That wall is called the vomer bone. The vomer bone. It's like a plow shaped. Um, the rounded part of the nose is called the nasal uh, rim uh, or the uh, um, a alar rim, ala, a l a, ala, or alar rim, yeah. And uh, the nasal base is where the septum connects with the upper part of the lip, right here. That's the nasal base, right this little corner. The, then we go inside of the nasal cavity, we find three shelves protruding, coming out. And the, these are called, have different names, but they're most often called the conchi. Uh, con, uh, um, conca is one, conchi is uh, more. So one, two, three, the, there are two big ones and a smaller one. And you can see it's almost like an air conditioning. You know, it expands the surface in the nasal cavity. And it's all lined up with the mucous membrane. Air goes in, down. Okay, as the air goes, you know, touches the surfaces, it gets the temperature, it gets the humidity that is uh, appropriate for the body. So it's like it serves in the air conditioning kind of, of the air as it goes into our body. And in addition, it enables us to get rid of, you know, particles and so on. Uh, but they have a negative effect of boy, on voice. They would uh, cause antiformants and contribute to absorption of the sound energy because of the long, long distance the air is going to go and the obstruction that it, the air will experience. So, um, 
Again, these are the functions, the nasal cavity, humidifies uh, air to make it um, a little bit humid if you live in a dry area, or tracks the humidity if you live in a, an area by the sea, uh, it makes adjustments of the temperature so that the temperature outside will be uh, body temperature by the time it goes into the lungs so it doesn't cause abnormalities and it also contributes to the smell, um, it gives us the smell because there is <coughs> the um, um, olfactory nerve comes in and sends all these uh, branches lining up the inside of the nasal cavities and that is going to kind of you know particles that we eat or fly in the air and come to touch these sensors they will be identified and then we connect this to our memory and we know oh this is a burger on the grill of you know coming from my neighbor's house or this is you know something whatever smell so it comes in contact with the uh, sensors, receptors of the olfactory nerve, and that is going to enable us to smell. More than that, the um, more than 70% of your taste is smell. So that the tongue gives you the basic, you know, taste, you know, bittersweet and so on. But as you eat or drink something, it reaches 98 degrees, and that's going to make it evaporate. And as it evaporates, um, inside of the you know and it goes up uh, it will be sensed by the olfactory uh, sensors and that gives you the taste this is why when you have a cold and all of these are covered up with a thick wall of mucus so you know a sheet of mucus then you do not taste things as well okay so um the um, frontal part of the nasal cavity here is made out of cartilage. The, the, the wall between the two areas is, is that's the cartilage connected to the bone. Uh, bone. And um, the roof of the nasal cavity is the, the base of the skull. And it is made out of a you know, the famous, uh, the, the uh, butterfly-shaped bone uh, that is called um, <clears throat> um, the, it's shaped like a butterfly. I, I don't remember <laughs> the name of the, of the muscle, sorry. Um, but um, the then the, the hard palate serves as the floor of the nasal cavity and uh, as the roof of the oral cavity. Um, so the whole structure inside of the nasal cavity is lined up with a mucous membrane that secretes mucus and it will uh, contribute to filtering and uh, you know dust and humidity and so on. Okay, so this is the end of this uh, part uh, of uh, lecture number one. And um, I'm going to now start the next part for the second part. And it opens. Okay, so just you can pause now and come back later for this one, just to give yourself um, a brain divider. We, in the second part, we're discussing this particular the, the, the formats and how they relate to particular vowels and sounds. And now we are going to complete that uh, second part. So we spoke last time on about the nasal murmurs, nasal murmur, and how it, you can identify it as like vertical bars that are uh, not close to each other; they're separated. And that means these are the opposing forces that will, that are due to um, um, the, this uh, antiformants are due to attenuation or damping of the sound wave as the air goes into a longer distance and it faces a lot of obstruction. And as a result, you have these anti-formats or anti-resonance present with the, real, the true formats. So why do these formats occur? Recall that as the sound leaves the sound source, you know, and that as it travels step by step by step, every step it travels, it will lose it will lose energy because of friction and damping. And it will be higher in frequency, it will start to fade out. There will be at the outer the, when the, the wave will come to a point when there's a wave up front and the wave doesn't go beyond. The sound is not heard beyond that point. So the antiformance 
occur in the nasal cavity and they affect nasal sounds or sounds that are mixed with nasals. And um, the reason that they occur, for example, is there are several reasons you need to know. Number one, the blockage of the um, that happens when we make the sounds, it causes the air to reverse course and to travel a longer distance. Like imagine you have uh, you are traveling uh, to a particular town, town A, and then you have five miles left. You look in the gas, you have enough for five miles. And then as you go, and there's a detour, and that detour is going to take you away two miles. You're not going to make it. You have to, you're going to run five miles and then, because that made the journey longer. So um, the air is going out of the oral cavity and then you block it. Mm -hmm. So the lips close and the air, some of the air goes right into the nasal cavity, but some of the air goes into the oral cavity, hits the closure, bounces back and goes above the heart, the soft palate, and then goes out of the nose. So that makes the, long, the journey longer for the air. And that also uh, is going to dampen, weaken the energy and the sound wave. Uh, also, the nasal cavity itself has a lot of structures like this conchi and the convolutions and the mucus, and that is going to dampen, that's going to absorb more of the sound energy. And this is why the, the nasal cavity is shaped like a band um, uh, stop. It, it, it just really, really has an effect on weakening the sound wave. So then the third reason is that look at the size of the oral cavity as I'm speaking and look at the size of the nares. Now, if you have a big gate and there's a, um, the fire alarm goes on and there are hundred people in the building, they want to get out. All of them can get out and they leave, there's no blockage. But imagine that instead of a gate, you have a little door and you have a hundred people just rushing to get out of the door. You are gonna have high pressure behind that door and only a few people can get at once. And while they're waiting, that is gonna cause them to lose energy. So I mean, they are molecules. So know these three reasons and these are the reasons why antiformants occur. This is how you could see when there are sounds that come after or before a nasal sound, they will also have antiformants as well. So you say, mm, you start having it here. But then we say, mm, ma, 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 ah. Uh, so that ah uh, is not, because you transition from into ah, uh, that's going to make formats for that. Uh, it becomes nasalized. <coughs> so this is, um, so the antiformants will occur when the wind is, uh, reaches for the mm, reaches 1000 hertz, they start to occur. For, for mm, mm, the, when it reaches 2000 hertz. Why? Because when you say mm, the whole oral way is blocked. So now you have cold, the entire oral cavity with the pharynx with the nasal cavity. And that has to make the frequency lower because the, there's more a lot of space. Now when you say, mm, 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 that closes off, takes away some of the space from the oral tract, the vocal tract. When you say, mm, from the alveolar to the lips. So that's going to raise your frequency. This is why you go for, mm, it's 2000 hertz. Now go, mm, mm. Now you have taken out all this for distance from here to here. Out, and now you have only um, the space on the other side of the constriction. So that raises the frequency further. When you say, mm, and that will be 3000 hertz. This is where these formats emerge. Now for the sounds themselves, the format values themselves, the dark bands, the real formats for the nasal sounds, uh, they go between 200 to 200 hertz. That is very low because again, mm, you have the entire vocal tract resonating and they say mm, it reduces it a little bit. And for mm, it will um, it will also engage a huge space, but all of them range between 250 and 300 hertz. The liquids and glides. Liquids, oh, remember from L, L begins with an L, oh, and the other sound of liquids, er. So L and er. Uh, these, um, the airflow, it is continuous, but there's something in the middle standing in the way. So the air has to go around the constriction. And um, the um, the formant transitions, like when you go from one sound to the other, in, in a word, for example, um, they occur faster. You make a transition faster, like liquid, liquid. You get the transition goes faster, as opposed to, uh, for example, when you say um, tight, tight, there's a stop, you make it, you stop completely, and then, uh, and so there's a, a gap. But the, the transition for this uh, these sounds, the glides, what, yeah, the transitions are uh, come faster. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, the transitions for the liquids and the glides occur faster than the glides when you say e, yeah, ooh, yeah. The, it takes longer for these to, to make the transition. The yeah is a glide. It means you have two blended in sounds, vowels. And e, one is e and then uh, e, yeah, yeah, as in yes. That's the symbol for yes. I mean, the first part of yes. E and then epsilon and S. So the uh, yeah resembles E a lot, and it is characterized by um, having some deformant values for, similar to E. And we know that E has low F1 because the tongue is out and up and high, and uh, it has a high F2. Deformant transitions from, you know, when you say yeah, yeah, um, it is going to um, to depend on what sound, what vowel comes after or before the uh, the yeah sound. So here, for example, say I, I, ya. So A, uh, about 900 hertz, uh, e, and it dips because E is 300 or something, 270, and then uh, again. So you see the transition from one sound to the other, it, it is quite significant here because, the, but the second one, it comes faster than the first one, uh, yeah. uh, this one, you say E, 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 see how similar it is to the E, E is uh, uh, 300 or 270, and E, F1 is very similar to, to E, 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 so, but you can see also similarity in F2 and F3. Now we say ah, uh, wah, ah, uh, wah, ah, uh, wah, then you go, uh, ah is like 900, and then you say what round, and you dip to 300 or 270, and dip down and transition up again. Ah, wah. So these are the transitions how we go from sound to another. Now, e, we, e, we. 
Um, I mean, we discuss similar. Uh, we discuss this individually, but this is just to show you how when you go F1 is similar in E and and U, but then U, uh, uh, as you go up, then the frequency rises for for um, for both <coughs> for both of them. So U, I mean U is actually a blend a blend of U and uh, U, U as white white way U A. So it's a high back tongue position, and it it, it, it requires a rounding of the lips. And the formant values are very similar to U, <coughs> means uh, low F1 and relatively low F2. And the formant transitions from like U uh, sound to sound uh, is going to depend on what vowel comes before, what vowel comes after. So the liquids U and R, the, they have formant values. Uh, that are similar to each other because both of them have similar constriction. The, the tongue stands in the way, but the sound is continuous, and they actually have anti resonance because of that obstruction. So um, the O has both formants and anti formants because of the obstruction. And the F, F1, you need to know these values F1 for O and R is about 360 hertz, F2 is about 1300 hertz, F3 is about 27 hertz. So, like 2700 hertz. <coughs> so again, you see this a lot how the nature of how the sound is produced is going to depend on what comes before, what comes after, because you have to make transition to the sound and transition from the sound to another sound. The R is characterized by a trough-shaped tongue. You, you, you curve the tongue and backwards, <coughs> and it doesn't, <coughs> excuse me. In the American ear, the tongue doesn't touch the alveolar ridge. The sides of the tongue come in contact with the hard palate. This is why the ear is a palatal sound. And the lips are rounded, rounded. So F1 and F2 for R are very similar to those for O, and F3 peaks at 1600 hertz. So this is again highly influenced by what comes before, what comes after, that's the phonetic context. So we say R uh, R uh, So you see, moving from 900 for the R, uh, and then R. Uh, this is because there's a lot of resistance and uh, the trough shape down. And then you switch to F3, and, and I mean for R uh, again. Um, you see R. Uh, it's close to the uh, here, and then you, you have um, that transition that you find in the end is not the same as what's here because when you make the sound R, uh, it's gonna affect what comes after it. And this is why we call this roticized sometimes um, sound as a result <coughs> of coming after the R. Uh. We say E R E R E. So you see E R E. All of them have. Um, like a low F1, and then E, as you go from E, and then you switch to the or you dip down for F2, and then you rise again for F, you know, E, or E. So that's the transition. Here is ALA, ALA, uh, 900, uh, something, and then U is about 300, and then A uh, again. So it's symmetrical, and then you just get some activity up here. And this is E, Li, E, Li. So you could see E, L, E, similar F1, but they differ in the upper transitions uh, to the F1, F2, and F3. So that is the end of this part, and um, I hope it, it helps you. And um, uh, there will be one more section that will we'll finish and um, that will take care of this unit. And after that, we will focus on the auditory system and on the nervous system. These are the two units that remain from the class. Thank you.